Thank you very much. I'm going to call on our sponsor, Jonathan Davies, um, to speak, uh, to say a few words, and then uh, Mark Worthington will speak after, after Chris Chope has introduced him. Jonathan. Hello. Hello? <laughs> Hello, my name is Jonathan, and I'm an economics -aholic. <laughs> For my day job, I'm a wealth manager and as it happens, if anyone would like to receive every couple of months free economics and markets updates, just send me your email address, you'll never be junk mailed. The other thing is, I'm a nobody. You'll never hear from me again. I'm not a politician. I don't seek your vote. I, I just have some concerns. Some, I'm frightened about losing our freedoms. <laughs> It remains a mystery to me that free market capitalists argue strongly that it's right that we should have artificial interest rates. Currently they're extremely low, but they're artificial. And also that it was right that we handed and continue in effect to hand globally thousands of billions of dollars, pounds, to failed businesses. Now, whatever the economics case for it, although I don't buy the one that they say, um, it's not free market capitalism. Because capitalism without bankruptcy is like Christianity without hell. <laughs> Now you are a relatively very well informed bunch of people and yet I wonder how many of you are aware of the Great Depression in the United States in 1920 to 21. Everyone knows about the 1930s but there's some blank faces. I will assert that the principal reason why many people don't know about it is because quote, they unquote don't want people to know. We'll explore that. <coughs> At the end of World War I, with the men returning from Europe, the great American manufacturing concerns believed that demand for their goods was going to soar. So they ramped up production. Demand didn't rise. There was a massive oversupply of goods for sale. Prices plummeted. The businesses were in turmoil. The economy went in a tailspin. Rapidly, unemployment rose from 4% to 12%. By some accounts, the GDP of the US collapsed 24%, it was a huge depression. Still not ringing any bells. Isn't that funny? Before I say what happened next, I'd like to spring forward to recent and current times and we can perhaps compare and contrast policy actions. In the 20 years to 2008, the politicians and the central banks created the biggest asset price inflation in human history. And many believe that 2008 was the bursting of that particular bubble. I think they're wrong. I think that will be merely the hors d'oeuvre. That the main course bursting, unfortunately, is still to come. Anyone who watched Robert Peston on China last month will have an inkling of what we're talking about. And of course, most of the EU is in a generational depression and I believe that most of the rest of the West will follow. Because you know, the next time we have a hard recession, which probably will not be created internally, but will be a global economic shock, do you know the one thing they can't do? They can't slash interest rates. So in 2009, essentially the policy actions that they took were to A, slash interest rates, to the benefit of the reckless lender and the reckless borrower, to the detriment of the saver, and practically everyone under the age of 35. And of course they also borrowed previously unimagined amounts of money from our children, and God help them from our grandchildren 
and handed it to failed businesses, yeah. aka banks. Yeah. Five years later, the global economy is at best fragile. I think actually it's going to fall over a cliff within perhaps maybe the next two or three years. And the fact that the UK has some growth is not because we're a sea of, in a sea of tranquility. No, it's because we have uh, still the emergency interest rate. Does anyone see an emergency? Because our so-called capitalist government is borrowing £110 billion a year from our children to pretend there isn't a problem. Because we've had, since 2013, in my opinion, the most Marxist policy since Gordon Brown, the most inequitable as well, it's called help to buy, or as I call it, or as I call it, help to sell. This is not a left and right thing. This is about the, the politicians, or as I call them, the machines, who are, part, who are at the heart of the machinery of government, who don't give a damn about the long-term prosperity and freedoms of the people. All they care about is the machinery and the next four or five years. And if I was in their position, I would too, but I'm not. And the thing is, what I see is a rising merger between corporation and state, which as many of you will have immediately realized is what Mussolini called fascism. And we all know what will happen to our freedoms under those conditions. So let's go back to 1920. The economy was in turmoil. Woodrow Wilson was in the last year of his presidency and he suffered two debilitating strokes. So he stopped leading. His wife, in fact, took over, but she didn't make any big decisions. So they didn't intervene. The incoming president, Warren G. Harding, of whom millions have since said, who? <laughs> Was a capitalist and a free marketer. And he had um, Herbert Hoover, his commerce secretary, who of course became president going into the 1930s, in his ear saying, we have to stimulate, we have to help, we have to invest. We're in the Reagan room. What did Ronnie Reagan say? I'm from the government, and the four most dangerous words in the English language, I'm here to help. <laughs> you might just want to, if you're interested, go and read Harding's inauguration speech. It's a sight to behold. The likes of which we haven't seen since, and unfortunately, we're never going to see again. His response to Hoover was effectively yada yada and promptly slashed government spending. He balanced the budget. He reduced government borrowing, as in government debt. And most importantly of all, he let the failed businesses go bust. Yes. <laughs> They made their bed, they lie in it, instead of borrowing from the next generation. Ladies and gentlemen, within 18 months, the US was back to full employment, and then they had the roaring 20s. If that isn't the strongest case to, to bring back capitalism, I don't know what is. You know, it occurs to me, if the music industry didn't have free market capitalism, we might never have heard of Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, The Beatles, The Doors, The Clash, John Peel, Michael Jackson, One Direction. Okay, capitalism isn't perfect. We'd all be listening to Mantovani, the Andrews sisters and Sinatra for the next 75 years. Although, looking around the room, I suspect there's a couple of people for whom Mantovani was the height of your teenage rebellion. Now, I have witnesses that I said this before Lord Tebbit earlier today. But if you, I'm not a gardener, but if you want your garden to bloom, you need to let the flowers grow and develop. 
and prune back the weeds, not help them, which is what is going on. These machines in government, I think they're so inept or couldn't care. I think they're so inept, they couldn't even manage a grocer shop. <laughs> Just over 20 years ago, Mel Gibson shouted, Freedom! <laughs> but not with a Scottish accent. <laughs> I would like tonight to update that call. And I hope, I ask you, I beg you to spread the message for our children. Bring back capitalism, let the market set interest rates, and ban bank bailouts. Yeah. Yeah. Simon, congratulations to you and your team for an amazing weekend. Thank you for the honour and privilege of speaking to this group. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Have a superb evening. Thank you.